What's up, guys? Just finished an interview with Corey Sanhagen. We talked about all sorts of things, what it means for him to be able to invest in fighters. We broke down his last fight against Petr Jan. Uh, we talked about what fighters he'd like to face next. And we just talked about everything, his view of the world, um, even a potential money fight against O'Malley, if he had any interest in that, uh, and what fighters he'd like to invest in. So check it out here right now. All right, what is up, guys? I'm here with Corey Sanhagen uh, interviewing. If, in case you're not aware, we are partnering here at Prediction Strike with Corey. We're super excited to have you. How are you doing, man? Yeah, I'm good, man. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah, I'm doing just fine. Um, I want to get right into it. Um, so for everyone who doesn't know Prediction Strike, right, we're the stock market for sports. And I want to ask you, Corey, what does it mean for you to finally be able to invest in yourself and other fighters? Yeah, I think that is, it's, a, it's a much more uh, conducive idea to what I would be interested in. Uh, I'm terrible at calling fights. So I, I really am not huge on, uh, doing a lot of like the sports betting on, on single, you know, fights and games and stuff like that. But I really like the idea of, uh, what you guys are doing where it's, um, you know, like it, it's just more consistent. You're, you're not going to win a bunch or lose a bunch. Like it's just more consistent, which, uh, is just like a smarter way to invest your money instead of, you know, throwing a bunch of money on Nunez and then losing oh, man. <laughs> because, you know, it went, it went south for her. So, uh, yeah, man, I, I, I love the idea a lot. And, uh, and I'm really happy that you guys are doing something like this. It's super smart. Yeah. That's great to hear. Yeah. Like I was never too comfortable putting big wagers on things, but if I go down 15% or whatever it is, I can live with that, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. and I want to ask you now about your last fight. It's been six weeks since you had your interim title fight against Peter Jan. Looking back at it now, deep has some time to digest. How do you feel about your performance? Is there anything you would have done differently looking back now? Uh, you know, I, I did my best, man, with, with the time that I was given. You know, like uh, I lied a lot in the interview saying that I was pr preparing and all of that, you know. But uh, when they told me about it, that's when I started training for it, to be honest with you. Um, mm. I did that just because I didn't want Jan having a bunch of confidence about me taking a short notice fight. So, um you know, with, with the five, Jan's one of the best guys in the world, you know, so with, with the five weeks that I was able to prepare, I, I thought that I did a really great job. I think I was doing really awesome, you know, everything was kind of going to the game plan and then I got dropped in round three and that's kind of when mm -hmm. things shifted for me. Um, in round four, man, I was just, you know, I was on, you know, I was on wobbly legs a little bit and, uh, and, and that's all the credit to Jan because, you know, he, he hit me good. And, um, but, but it definitely affected the way that I fought the rest of the fight. Like in round four, I wasn't able to do too much. In between round four and five, I think I got my heart rate down enough to kind of be able to focus a lot better on what was actually happening and not get my ass whooped like I did in round four. So, But I knew that I was pretty damaged and I was pretty hurt going into round five. So I really had to play that round smart too because the guy hits really hard also. So, um, you know, I, I think that – and, you know, this is typical fighter stuff, but it, it, I think I was just that mistake away from winning, to be honest. Um, I think round one, I for sure won. Round two was a lot closer than what the judges scored it. But uh, that was, you know, a debatable round three. I was winning all the way up until that last minute. And I wasn't getting tired. I was feeling good. And then uh, just, you know, got rocked and then was kind of rocked the rest of the fight. So I had to, had to fight a little bit different. But um, like I said, man, pretty happy with how I did. Yeah. And you mentioned it. Did the judges scorecards confuse you or bother you at all? Like I just rewatched it and I had you one and two easy. Uh, 49, 46 was, was kind of wild. Yeah. Uh, that was anticipated though, man. Like I knew I was in Abu Dhabi, like people were cheering for him. It, it, it's kind of interesting, man, because, uh, you like to think that it doesn't matter that much, but, uh, it, it does matter a lot where you're fighting because if mm -hmm. you are a guy and you have more fans in there, a punch looks like a punch almost every single time, you know, like so sometimes guys get hit and you're like, Oh, that definitely hurt that guy. But nine times out of 10, you can't tell the difference between that. But when it's the difference of me landing a punch and then him landing a punch and the whole crowd going, Oh, that makes a big difference. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So that was, that, all of that was anticipated, man. Uh, I, I knew that I was in enemy territory and I was going to have to mm -hmm. Like win win in order to win, so uh, it, it didn't surprise me. I mean, if it was in Colorado, that definitely wouldn't have been the way that they were scored. So that's just the name of the game, man. It's a, it's a tough sport, and that's the psychological part is part of it. Yeah. Did you know Abu Dhabi was going to be like a hostile territory? Like it's not Brazil, right? Or like, did you know it was the Eastern European Peter Jan fan base was going to be there? Uh, I, I had an idea and I wasn't a hundred percent sure until we did the press conference. And then there was like mm. six 
or seven different language interpreters. And it was like me and I think one other American in the, at the press conference. And I was like, Oh, okay. So this is going to be a lot different of a crowd than, than what I'm yeah, used to. Yeah. <laughs> and looking back at it now, do you want to fight there again? Not just because of that, but the experience of fight Island, or are you looking back to full packed arenas in the United States? Um, I was, so in Abu Dhabi, so I was at, um, I was at the Volkanovski and Ortega fight, uh, mm-hmm. I think like five or six weeks before I had fought and the energy in the T-Mobile arena is a lot different than the energy in the Abu Dhabi arena. Um, I still love, I, I still like fighting in Abu Dhabi. It's always been fun for me. Uh, but no, nah, man, at Vegas, like the, the, the crowd is just, the, and the energy is just like way, way more intense. So I would prefer that. Yeah. Um, I actually was just noticing that about the 268 card in Madison Square Garden. Like I had not remembered how loud it could get in these places, you know? Yeah. Crazy, uh, crazy. That's how I felt at the Ortega and uh, Volkanovsky fight when they fought. It was just like, literally probably couldn't hear the person next to you, you know? And that was such a crazy fight too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about something. I was watching your interviews and you had an interview with Joe Rogan where you mentioned that after the Aljo fight, you kind of changed your mentality a bit just to maybe be a bit more aggressive and to make sure you're putting damage on during the fights. Obviously, after that, you had stellar KO victories uh, and now you've had two difficult fights. Do you want to maintain this aggressive mentality or is it evolving over time? Oh, it's always evolving, man. I I feel like I'm a different fighter every day sometimes, you know? Um, And uh, yeah, I I think that understanding the aggressive side of things was an important part in my journey. You know, like I, I kind of see fighting as this, um, you know, a little micro world that I get a lot more understanding in than the macro world that we live in. And, um, uh, I, I understand that, you know, there's ebbs and flows to life and stuff like that. And, you know, it teaches you different things at different times. And I think that after that Aljo fight, it was an important thing for, you know, the universe or the fight world to teach me that, uh, uh, I need to tap into that aggressive, you know, like shadow side of things, you know, and uh, mm. that I did a really good job with that. And then I think I just need to balance the scale a little bit more because when I went into the Dillashaw fight, I think I was a little bit too much on the, on the, uh, on the aggressive side um, in, in a way where I, I wasn't mm. fighting um, to the, to the play of like what, uh, how they're scored and things like that. And, okay. and, that it's still a sport because uh, sometimes I just get caught up in the idea of like, Oh no, like we're going out there to hurt each other. Like, let's just try to knock each other out and do all that. Yeah. But yeah. So I, I think I just needed to balance the scales a little bit more. And I think I did a good job of that in the yawn fight. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just, you know, part of my journey in the sport and in life. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm always learning, man. You know, like, yeah. I, you know, I actually got a question from one of our media partners called Brawler Bible, and he was saying that you have like a very interesting perspective, not just in fighting, but in the way you view the world. And he wanted to know where you get that from. He knows that you're an avid hiker and that like helps ground you. Uh, what else brings you to that sort of learning state besides fighting? Yeah. So, um, uh, it, it's kind of interesting because when, uh, when, you know, uh, embedded will be here or UFC, whatever people will be here or whoever's following me around for promotional stuff. Like they're like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, well, Mm -hmm. I kind of just lay here and close my eyes and do like, you know, and like, or like look outside and watch my dogs play or like, you know, uh, I I don't really try to do a ton of like crazy stuff in order to keep me present for me. Like, uh, like I said, like, this is more of like a spiritual journey and I, and it's, uh, I get to live it in a bit of a micro world that I can understand a lot better than what's happening in the real world. So, um, for me, I do a lot of like self hypnosis type things, um, Mm -hmm. which are super helpful for me. Um, I, I think that there's a lot going on inside of our, inside of our bodies and in our minds and in our spirits that, you know, we don't have a lot of access to because we just have the busyness of, the world, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. I do a lot of those types of things just to just see what's going on inside of my heart. You know what I'm saying? Because fighting is a super stressful thing sometimes. And, um, in order, yeah, for me to stay grounded, sometimes it's the mountains. A lot of the time it's like these self hypnosis things. Um, a lot of the times, like, it's just like killing myself in workouts. Like I learned that about myself is that, uh, one major thing that I have, like that, that keeps me present is like, I have to have 
I have to sometimes be doing things that really suck. So, uh, so I would say that it's probably those three things, you know, like working out to the point that it sucks a lot of self hypnosis stuff. So I could see how I'm really doing inside. And then, uh, and then, yeah, going to the mountains and kind of being around the trees and the rocks and stuff. Yeah. And when you enter that micro world of the cage, do you feel immediately present or is it so chaotic and nerve wracking that you, you almost, it feels like a blip on the radar? Oh no, I love it. I love it. Really? I, I, it. It took me a while to, to love it. Um, because it is like a stressful thing and we put a bunch of pressure on ourselves and, mm. you know, um, but no, man, I, I, I love it. I, I love standing across from the person and knowing that they're going to try and, and knowing that they're one of the best in the world at what they do, knowing that I'm the same, looking them in the eyes before the fight. And just, you know, we both have this mutual agreement that whatever happens in the next 25 minutes is, you know, uh, okay. And, and that's like a really fun thing for me. That sounds wild, but that's sick. <laughs> right? um, I want to also ask you about the current state of the UFC bantamweight division. In my view, it's the best division in the sport. Uh, you're the only person to have faced TJ, Aljo, and Petter. If you could have it your way, what would be the matchup you're most interested in having next? Yeah, yeah. those three. Uh, Jan, definitely. Um, you know, the, the, the TJ one stung, but uh, it, it, it kind of stung in a weird way. Um, it stung in a way where it's like, how did I beat that guy up and then walk out a loser, you know? So, uh -huh. but, but I definitely understand that, uh, there, there were parts of that. I just neglected in that fight that lost me that fight. So that one kind of stings in a different way. Honestly, I would really like to fight Jan again, just because I really admire the guy's skill. I think that he's really, really good. And one day I really hope to, you know, beat him up and, and show that I'm more skilled than that guy because the, he, he was really good. He, he made some really good adjustments. Mm -hmm. Um, and he did some, you know, like he, he was a good fighter on that, on that night. So I would really want to get that one back because in my eyes, he's the best out of the three, you know, the Aljamain fight went how the Aljamain fight went, but I, I feel like that was just an error that I was making up here and not really like a technical thing. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so that's I think who I would like to rematch the most, and he has the belt, so you know. Yeah, I, I, well, that'd be exciting as heck. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, he's such a unique fighter, right? With the the way he holds his high guard, do you feel like you've learned the lessons you needed to make those changes or or to sort of fixes in that up in a, in a rematch, or is it is he just that good that you can't make those kind of reads like that easily? Uh, I, no, there's definitely ways that you can like counteract that. I think that I, again, like, I think that I was doing an awesome job with it mm -hmm. one, two, and then the first four minutes of three. Um, so, so it's just one of those things where, uh, uh, I know that I'm going to fight him again, so I'm not going to say too much of, you know, what, what yeah, yeah, sure. and be of course, but, uh, I, I definitely believe that if I would have done a couple of things differently than, uh, and, and not had made that mistake, then I, I would have walked away the winner that night. Man. Yeah. And as a fan, that's probably the one I'd want to see the most. If you look at like all the comments or everyone on the MMA media space, they're saying that fight was probably the highest skill match that fans have seen maybe ever. Uh, and I just rewatched it and I was like, that's definitely true. Yeah. 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 I, I appreciate that too. And, uh, that's, I, I see myself as like the technical guy, you know, like I don't talk shit. I don't, you know, mm -hmm. like act crazy to get attention. Like I get attention by like showing off my skills. And, uh, so, so when that's kind of the word that's going around that, that makes me feel really good. No, that's great. Um, and I wanted to ask you about, there's a couple of other Bantamweights that have been making huge noise um, and having great performances. We've seen Cruz just have a great performance uh, against Munoz, uh, Aldo uh, having a resurgence. Do either of those potential matchups excite you or are you looking uh, more up the rankings? No, yeah, definitely. Both. You know, uh, I, I know what position I'm in, man. Like I'm coming off with two losses, you know. Uh, granted, one of them was very close and the other one was a short notice title fight. It doesn't really matter, I, I think. Uh -huh to some people, you know, I'm still coming off with two losses. So at this point, I'm just willing to hear what the UFC has to say next and then kind of just, uh, and then just go from there. So if it's one of those two, awesome, you know, uh, right now in my career, my goal is just, you know, fight for the belt again, as soon as I kind of can. And, um, and so whatever, whoever is going to make that happen for me is the person that I'll fight next. And from a legacy perspective, do either of them interest you more? Um, Actually, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't know. Um, I think it'd be really cool. Ah, man, fighting both of those guys would be really cool. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, those a legend. You know, all those a legend, and then Cruz is also a legend. So in my eyes, they're very equal, you know? Yeah.
Uh, and I have to ask because the name that's making the most bantamweight noise last week and, and on our platform, the most in demand uh, was the now newly ranked Sean O'Malley. Would you have any interest in fighting that far down the rankings uh, for a money fight of that sort? Or does it have zero interest to you as a competitor? Uh, I, I'm not in the uh, money fight part of my career yet. You know, uh, I understand that that's like, uh, you know, something that definitely happens to fighters where, you know, you reach a certain point in your career and it's like, all right, let's just kind of start doing this stuff for bigger paychecks and stuff. Um, so if, oh, if, if the UFC told me, Hey, O'Malley is going to get you a lot closer to a title fight than Cruz or Aldo or Font or whoever it is that they want to throw at me next. If they were like, that's going to get you closer to a title fight, then of course I would take it. So, um, my focus is getting closer to a title fight right now. That's where I am in my career. I don't want to retire as, and, and never have that thing around my waist. So, um, yeah. right where I'm living, if that means Sean O'Malley, then awesome. Uh, but would I do it just for like a buttload of money and all of that? Probably not. I, right now it's just, you know, who's going to get me closer to a title fight. Mm -hmm. And in looking at the title fight that's going down next, uh, going to be the, the unification of Petr Jan and Aljamain Sterling. How do you see that fight going down, having faced both of them? Um, I think it's probably going to go a lot like the first time that they went, um, where Aljamain will, you know, do his thing in probably the first round. Jan will stay really protected like he's really good at. And then I think in the later rounds, Jan is going to start to take over. Mm -hmm. It was it was cool. I think I, I had no, I mean, I mean, media people have started to see Jan's, his, probably his best skill is his, is, is his ability to make adjustments. Uh, and that first minute or two, Aljo was putting a beating on, on Jan too, which was wild to see. Uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, to, to be honest with you, man, like uh, if you throw any man into a cage and just have him go wild for like however long he can, like one or two minutes, he'll probably look kind of decent against maybe some of the best guys in the world. You know, the, the question mm -hmm how long can you do that for? Like how, how long can you, you know, and, and, and that kind of got shown in that Aljamain young fight where it's like, yeah, Aljamain did a really awesome job doing that for a little bit, but it definitely wasn't a sustainable thing. And, uh, being a really good fighter means that you're able to do things at, uh, a, a pace that you can sustain for the entirety of the fight. And if you can't do that, then your, your, your skills don't matter at that point. So, mm -hmm. um, so while that was the case that, you know, isn't that, that doesn't mean anything to me, you know, you know, like, like I said, you could throw any man kind of in there for a minute and they, and they can just go off and wail on the person. And you'd be like, Oh, like that guy looks like he can fight. But then, you know, seven, eight minutes into a fight, does he still look the same? Probably not. Mm, okay. Um, and before I want to let you go, uh, I want to ask you if you can invest and I know you have teammates and, and such, but if you had to invest in, a featherweight, a lightweight, and a welterweight right now, and only one. Uh, who would you who would you consider investing in? Ooh, a featherweight. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to think of who just fought at featherweight. Um, Emmett, Emmett and Ige was a really good fight last weekend. Um, I think Emmett is a very dangerous and kind of a scary guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. at one um, so I could, I could definitely see Emmett doing really good. Um, Volkanovsky, I think is definitely worth a huge investment. I think he's going to be at the top of that division for a really long time. So I guess I would say Volkanovsky, um, a lightweight, I gotta go with, you know, Justin Gaethje, who's my teammate, uh, uh -huh. Gaethje. Uh, I think if he can beat, uh, Olivier, then man, that would make me super, super happy and proud of him. Um, and then, uh, what at one seventy? Yeah. I, I think, I think, uh, uh, I, I really hope Neil gets to fight that Chima Ve Chima Ve's guy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I would really like to see Neil fight that guy just because I think that that would be such a huge win. I think that that would be really awesome. Uh, if Neil could be that guy. And I think that Neil's stock would just shoot through the roof if he did. So, uh, you know, as biased as it sounds, I, I chose two, two mates teammates and <laughs> one champ. So <laughs> no, I like it. Uh, we'll be giving all of our investors a little, uh, fighter insights for sure. Yeah. All right, Corey, I thank you for having us. Um, we're super excited to be partnering with you. Uh, huge fans on a personal level and as a, and as a company. So can't wait for your next fight. Uh, and we'll do other events and stuff. So we'll, we'll stay in touch. Cool. Sounds great, man. Thanks a lot for having me on. Of course.